turn in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to uh, continue in our series on the book of Ruth. Uh, while we're turning there, I want to remind us that the church are those who are found in and through Jesus Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit. That we together are building one another up so that we might be formed into the image of Christ. And so the church is not a building, but it is a people. And that people are continually being formed by the word of God so that we might have faith as we understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're going to read from a bit of a larger portion from the book of Ruth today, all of chapter 3, as we read together. And so here's what it says in Ruth chapter 3. It says, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Now isn't Boaz one of our relatives? Haven't you been working with his female servants? This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfumed oil, and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. So Ruth said to her, I will do everything you say. She went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had charged her to do. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, he went to lie down at the end of the pile of barley, and she came secretly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. At midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there, laying at his feet, was a woman. So he asked, who are you? I'm Ruth, your servant, she replied. Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Then he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown more kindness now than before. Because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Now don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer, but there is a redeemer closer than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem you, that's good. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will. Now lie down until morning." So she lay down at his feet until morning, but got up while it was still dark. Then Boaz said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. And he told Ruth, bring your shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she held it out, he shoveled six measures of barley into her shawl, and she went into the town. She went to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who asked her, what happened, my daughter? Then Ruth told her everything the man had done for her. She said, he gave me six measures of barley because he said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Naomi said, my daughter, wait until you find out how things go, for he won't rest until he resolves this today. And then from 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, little children, let us lo not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today I hope to encourage us from this sovereignty redeems history. Sovereignty redeems history. Now remember the setting for the book of Ruth is that it is set during the time of Judges. And as we look at these two books together, what we recognize is that they're held up together as these stark contrasts. In the book of Judges, you see almost the result of human depravity. And in contrast to that, in the book of Ruth, you see the beauty of love. And so you see these two different ways, these two different paths that the nation of Israel takes. And there's something about this idea of love that is unveiled that we see in a deeper way throughout the book of Ruth that is inviting us to a new understanding of love to our faith community, to the world around us. You see, there's something about love that when you love someone, you begin to respond to their needs in irrational ways. Maybe you've been in love with somebody, and as you are in relationship with that person, your heart compels you to do things for that person that you wouldn't ordinarily do for just anyone else. You're willing to sacrifice for that person. You're willing to give what is best to that person. There's something about them that captivates you and that calls you to pour out your heart before them to give all that you have sacrificially to all of who they are. In the marriage vows here in America, those marriage vows kind of give a little bit of a picture of what love looks like as we say things like this, that we are going to have and hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish 
till death do us part. And this love for a spouse is really very incredible. To be able to give this kind of vow, this kind of commitment to somebody that says, listen, whether you are sick or whether you're well, whether we are rich or if we are poor, I'm with you no matter what. And if you've experienced that kind of love, then you know what that's talking about. And then there's something that happens in life that gives you a new perspective on what love really means, which is when this little bundle of joy comes into your life, and all of a sudden it gives you the highest highs and the lowest lows as you welcome your child into the world, and you recognize that as this little bundle is dependent on you, there's a new level of love that is unlocked in your soul that you maybe have never experienced before. And it's this kind of love, this kind of love that causes you to say, I will sacrifice myself for the sake of another. I will wake up even though I should rightfully get an additional hour of sleep because it's daylight savings time. I will love this child even though they didn't get the memo that I will love them no matter what. It's this kind of love that's a hesed kind of love. It's this kind of love that this Hebrew word hesed begins to give us an understanding of what love is really like. It's not the love that's a love of just simply a fairy tale where everything goes well and you go off into the sunset feeling all the feels. It's not just simply the love of a rom-com or a Hallmark movie. It's the kind of love that during the worst, during the poor, during the sickness, it's in those moments that true love finds it's home, that true love finds what it really is all about. And throughout this book of Ruth, what we find is that this love between Ruth and Naomi, this Hesed kind of love, shows itself as they live in poorer, shows itself as they lived through sickness as their spouses passed away, showed itself as it felt like there was no future as they faced a patriarchal society. They're in the downturn side of those kind of wedding vows. But in these moments, what we recognize is that love shines the brightest. We're given an image of those who love from those that we would really expect the least. Like you wouldn't expect to be able to see these two women in a patriarchal society be incorporated into the holy scriptures. And yet here's what we see in the Bible is these two women, these two unexpected characters, an outsider that begins to push forward the narrative for the Hebrews, what it really means to have hesed kind of love. And it's to this that we are reminded that when the world is in darkness, when we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to go, when we don't know how to act, when the world is in darkness, we love. You see, remember that these uh, unlikely characters are teaching us something about how we can love in the world. Because remember, Ruth is a Moabite. And as a matter of fact, there's this understanding that, yes, it's set in the time of Judges, and there's certain textual critical scholars that would say that it's actually responding to, it's being written by those during the time of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, it's very much a, a push away from outsiders, and that those outsiders who have married into the nation of Israel are essentially like encouraged to like divorce their spouses. And so there's a certain theory that says that to that, the book of Ruth gives a different perspective to say that even those who look like outsiders, who were not a part of the original people of God, the nation of Israel, that they can still be incorporated into the people of God and show the people of God truly how to love. What true covenant love and faithfulness looks like, what true hesed love looks like. And it tells us how the greatest king of Israel, David, came from the line of the unexpected Moabite. Turn to the end of the book of Ruth in chapter four, and it's the genealogy that we all kind of pass by, and yet here's what we find. It says, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now, genealogy might not mean much to us, but to an Israelite, this is the foundation of who they are, of where they came from, and this brings us to the unlikely character of Ruth. Because what we see throughout the book of Ruth is more important than where you've been is where God is bringing you. Or maybe to put it in a different way, that for us to recognize today that when the world is in darkness, love, because the love of God shows that his sovereignty is greater than your history. 
the love of God shows that his sovereignty is greater than your history. Because what we recognize is that in this narrative, it would be easy for us to look at Ruth, a Moabite, and judge her based off of her past. But what we're invited to is that love changes the narrative. The love of God working through his people changes the narrative so that God's sovereignty writes us a new future, so that God opens up a new way of life for us and that we are not stuck to, chained to the past, but we can move forward into the future as those who are redeemed because God is writing in his sovereignty a new future for us. And so let's go ahead and let's come to our passage and look at what it has to say about the past and how God is redeeming our history by his sovereignty. So in verse one, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi said to her, my daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Now isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with his female servants? This evening he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfumed oil, wear your best clothes, go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man know who you are until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying. Go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. Now what's interesting again is that two women are driving the narrative of this biblical account, which is really incredible because you don't get many documents that value women in a patriarchal society. And what we find, though, is that these two women are driving forward the biblical narrative so much so that they are setting up the story for the greatest king ever to reign in Israel, King David. And all of a sudden, it brings into picture this understanding of the value of women, of the value of women that so often it seems like men are the ones who are controlling history. But throughout the biblical narrative, note that so often it's actually the women who demonstrate faithfulness. It's actually the women that demonstrate faithfulness as disciples, that when the men are doubting, the women continue to remain steadfast. And so to that narrative, what we recognize is that the unlikely are oftentimes the ones who are actually doing the incredible things. And this is true for the women who are driving forward this narrative. What's interesting is that Naomi actually, in this moment, something happened to Naomi. Remember that she's been bitter. She's changed her name to Mara. She's rebranded herself. And yet something happens along the way where all of a sudden she starts to look outside of herself to the well-being of Ruth. It would seem to be that Ruth's hesed love for Naomi is what then sparks the hesed kind of love that then Naomi has for Ruth and encourages Ruth to do something that will change her future. And so we begin to see this picture that Naomi lays out. She says, listen, Ruth, like, get yourself ready. You know, put on your best clothes, take a shower, make sure that you smell good, and then, like, make sure that you kind of hide away and make sure that Boaz has had, like, a good night, you know? You got to make sure that it's primed for you to be able to step into the situation. And really throughout this, that there's actually a lot of, like, problems and potential risks with this plan, that Ruth is an outsider Moabite. And so you can imagine that as an Israelite finds an outsider Moabite laying at his feet, what the reaction might be. There's this problem that this risk that it feels like Ruth doesn't have anything to offer. There's a risk that by going out, she could be taken advantage of by Boaz or by other men who find her out late at night. And so there's a risk involved with what this plan is driving forward. But yet we find that Ruth is okay with that risk to be able to see redemption in her family, redemption to her story. And so she goes out in verse five. She says, I will do everything you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had charged her to do. You almost kind of see the scene then unfold. You know, if it was like on a stage, it would be like, okay, lights fade down on Naomi and Ruth and then lights fade up, you know, on Boaz. And he's just like out there, like doing his job, you know, threshing and winnowing and all that kind of stuff. And then he, you know, he has something to eat, has something to drink, lays down. And then in the like, in the shadows of the narrative, you see Ruth coming to the side, right? And so it says, he went to lie down at the edge of the pile of barley and she came secretly, uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over and there laying at his feet was a woman. 
So we asked, which if you ever find a woman laying at your feet, this is a good question. Who are you? Like, what, what is happening? How is this happening to me? To which Ruth says, I'm Ruth, your servant, she replied. Take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. So from Boaz's perspective, he's just like having a good night. He's having a good time. He's in good spirits. You know, all of his investments are going well, you could say. He had a good meal. He went to sleep. And all of a sudden, like, he wakes up and something happens. Now, there's something that is being communicated in the subtext that is linking back to other texts throughout the biblical narrative. And some of the links that we're seeing link back to women that oftentimes the church has said are seductive in some way that these women in some way are less than desirable. They've been labeled by the church many times as being those who embody a certain type of woman. So let's look at some of the subtext that's going on in, in this scene. So as we look back at scripture, we see women who are blamed for being seductive in the church, women like Tamar, you know? So Tamar, um, she's supposed to be married to one of the youngest brothers so that she's able to bear uh, the, the lineage through uh, her history. And so uh, her father-in-law, Judah, instead of doing what was according to the law, does not pair her with the youngest son. And instead, what she needs to do is she dresses up like a prostitute, sleeps with Judah, and gets pregnant by him. Now, oftentimes, you know, sometimes what happens is in the church, we say, well, there it is. You know, notice the woman. She's seductive. And yet what we find in scripture is that actually Tamar is justified in that Judah wasn't acting according to the law and should have given her his son to begin with. Look at Rahab, right? If you want to be branded as someone, I don't think that your name Rahab, you don't want it to be like paired with the harlot, <laughs> right? But that's kind of like, you know, what happens is we end up pairing somebody like Rahab with the title the harlot. But in reality, Rahab is mentioned in the book of Hebrews for her faith. Or what about Bathsheba? Let's take her, somebody in the biblical narrative that you would say, well, obviously, you know, she was seducing poor David. He was just out there on his roof, and there she is bathing, you know. She was asking for it. And sometimes what happens is we label women in this way, but what we don't do is we don't give credit to the narrative in recognizing that it is not the narrative of women as being seductive in Scripture. And each one of these, notice that the women are just simply doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the men so often are those who are the oppressors. The men are those who victimize women. But what happens to the biblical narrative when two noble characters step in? Because remember that the line of the Moabites begins with a father who becomes drunk and then his daughters sleep with him. And so you're almost setting up the narrative that's the idea of like, okay, well, Boaz, he's like had a good time. You know, he's probably going to get drunk. She's going to go and she's going to take advantage of him. That's kind of what we're expecting to come from the narrative. That's what we're expecting from a Moabite. You know, wasn't it the Moabite women who lured away the men from God, you know, in Numbers chapter 25? It was the poor unsuspecting men and these women, you know, you got to look out for them. But we recognize that's not the way that scripture talks about women. That's not the respect, the honor that women get in so many of these passages in Scripture is actually that women drive forward the narrative in some way and encourage a different kind of narrative to be faithful to God. And this is what we see in, in Ruth, that Ruth does not seduce Boaz. She doesn't try to get him drunk and then take advantage of him. But what we see is a woman who redeems her being a Moabite and redeems her story. Because in that story, recognize that your past does not dictate your future because God in his sovereignty is rewriting the narrative. That as men and women give themselves to the Lord, that their history is changed. That yes, their ancestry might look like a, a bunch of branches that you wish that you could chop off, but that doesn't dictate the future and that's what's happening with Ruth. That yes, Ruth came from the line of the Moabites, but that doesn't dictate her future. What dictates her future is the redemption that God is acting in her story in this moment so that she can embody a different way of being in the world. And so for us, as we come to this passage, what we recognize is that God is rewriting the history of the Moabites to say, what if there was a woman of noble character, a woman who enacted a plan of redemption for her line 
in the way that God has laid out before her as we see all these different chances and happenstances that have come about. What if God says that he's in the business of redeeming our past, of redeeming our history, of redeeming our narratives? And what if some of those narratives that we have in our own mind that even the church has perpetuated of saying, well, men are always those who are oppressors, women are those who are always seductive. What if there's a different narrative that as we follow the narrative line of Boaz and Ruth, that we're offered a different way of seeing men and women in the world? And so here we see that rather than Boaz taking advantage of Ruth, rather than Ruth taking advantage of Boaz, we see two men and women of noble character living out a different way of being in the world, rewriting the story so that they can actually enact a new history, a new future for the nation of Israel, one that is written according to God's plan. And so here's the invitation for her. She actually uh, disobeys Naomi's order. Do you notice that Naomi tells her um, that she's just supposed to lay down at his feet and then just do whatever he tells her to do? That's what it says. When he lies down, notice the place, he will explain to you what you should do. But in response, what we see is that Boaz actually asks Ruth who she is, and she responds with her identity. She doesn't try to deceive him. She doesn't try to take advantage of him. She responds with her identity, and then she ups the ante and calls him to a level of righteousness and responsibility for her, where she says, take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. Now, that's very interesting because earlier on, Boaz had given a very specific prayer. The prayer that Boaz had given in chapter 2, verse 12, is may the Lord reward you for what you have done. Boaz speaking to Ruth. And may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then she says to Boaz, the one who prayed for her, take me under your wing. It's like in this language, Ruth is coming to Boaz and is saying, listen, you prayed this for me. Why don't you be the fulfillment of the prayer? And I think that there's this line in biblical understanding that says, listen, if you just simply hear of a need and you say, I'll pray for you, but you don't do anything, that that faith isn't really doing much for you. That we understand that faith without works is dead. That faith without love that actually moves you to do something is not true faith. And so you see how now Ruth is calling Boaz to true faith. A true faith that puts his words into actions. A true faith that calls him to actually do something for those who are vulnerable. And so it is that we continue to live at a time where true faith doesn't simply give lip service. But true faith actually does something, takes action for those who are in need. And as we look at this, it's interesting because technically, according to the law, Boaz doesn't really have a responsibility. There's two laws at play. The first one is the kinsman redeemer law, which is said that if there is a nearby relative, and especially like a brother or sister, that they have passed away, that you can purchase the land on behalf of them to keep it within the clan. The second law is the Levite law, which requires a blood brother of a man who dies without an heir to give an heir to that wife. Neither of these really specifically apply to this situation. Notice that there's distance between the law and what Boaz is required to do because of the distance between Boaz and Ruth, and especially because this law doesn't talk about how you're supposed to marry outsiders, how you're supposed to marry the, not Naomi, but like, the daughter-in-law of the one who is supposed to redeem. And so you can imagine that she's coming to Boaz and she's asking him to see the law differently. Not for the letter, but for the love. Not for the exact, like, lay it out in black and white, but for the heart underlying it. Does it sound like anybody else that we know as Jesus steps on the scene and says, you've heard it said, don't hate your, or don't kill, but... Don't be angry with your brothers and sisters. Why is that? Because he understands the underpinning of the law, which is that of love. And in that same way, Ruth is calling up for Boaz to understand the law in a new way, to understand this call to redemption according to the law in a new way that transcends the letter of the law and gives the very essence and heart of the law. And so here we see this idea of saying, Boaz You have a requirement, maybe not according to the letter, but according to the letter of love. According to the law of love, he has an expectation that he will transcend the law itself. 
to be able to redeem and restore somebody in need, which is really at the heart of what God has done for the nation of Israel up until this point. That when you think of what God has done, that he has transcended just simply letters of the law, and he has rescued and redeemed the nation of Israel for himself. He's rescued them from the nation of Egypt through the Exodus. He has called them to himself. He has made a covenant with them to say that regardless of whether or not they are faithless or faithful, that he'll remain faithful to them. That really, as we look at the work of Boaz, it is simply mimicking the work of God. That she's taking the redemptive work of God and she's applying it to this situation to call Boaz to a new ethic, an ethic of redemption, an ethic that is on par with the redemption that God has given to those who really in no way were uh, worthy of that redemption. And yet we see this call. So we see this play itself out and then Boaz responds. Verse 10, then he said, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown more kindness now than before because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Now, don't be afraid, my daughter. I will do for you whatever you say, since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Yes, it is true that I'm a family redeemer, but there is a redeemer closer than I am. Stay here tonight in the morning. If he wants to redeem you, that's good. Let him redeem you. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will now lie down until morning. So here, Boaz applies his knowledge of the law for the sake of Ruth. He applies his understanding for the sake of another. And whereas Ruth might not know the intricacies of the law, Boaz does, and he ensures that Ruth will be taken care of regardless of what happens in the law. He requires, he understands the requirement of love, and that love requires that he does something even in a way that transcends the law. And he puts his mind to it and says that he will do it. Now, as we look at this story, recognize that it is this redemptive action of Boaz that is moving forward history, that he's seeing this new kind of redemptive action that Ruth is calling him to. And so it is by this that now history is changing by God's sovereignty as God has placed Ruth and Boaz together, as he has placed them in proximity, as he has continued to bring them on this journey, that now we see that God's sovereignty is redeeming the broken history of Ruth and of Naomi, and God is still in that business today. And so she lays down at his feet until morning. He gives her food, a lot of it, and then she goes to her mother-in-law, to which Naomi asked her, what happened? Ruth tells her everything that Boaz did for her. And so uh, she says, Naomi says in verse 18, my daughter, wait until you find out how things go, for he won't rest unless he resolves this issue today. And so you see this idea where God is in the process of redeeming the history of Ruth. The immediate history of Ruth is we understand that Ruth lost her husband. Ruth was not able to bear a son. That God is in the process of redeeming that history, but also the long-term history of her family. And so know today that God is still in the process. He is still in the business of redeeming your story. That for some of us, we've experienced suffering and we're not sure what God is going to do with it. God is in the process of redeeming history and our suffering. That maybe for some of us, there are things that have happened in our past that we label ourselves based off of what happened in our past. Know that God is in the business of changing labels. That he tears off the label that is filled with shame that you say, well, you don't know what I've done. And God says, well, you don't know what I've done. That in the same way that Boaz redeems Ruth and gives her a new future, so God redeems your identity to say you're no longer identified with what you did in your past. You are now labeled by son of God, daughter of God. You're not labeled with who you slept with. You're not labeled by your bankruptcy. You're not labeled by how you used to parent. You're not labeled by your political identity. What God does is he comes in and he says, all of those things mean nothing compared to the one label that matters most, most, which is the redemptive label of son or daughter of God. That for some of us, we feel like we are chained to the history of our past or the history of our family. That we would say, listen, you don't understand. My family's got a bad last name in town. And what God would say to that is, you don't understand. I'm in the business of redeeming those who have bad names in town. If he can do it to a Moabite, he can do it to you. 
He can redeem your future. And what that means is God is in the business of breaking those shackles, of breaking those chains, and of redeeming and restoring and bringing us into a new future by the working of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the true fulfillment of Boaz. He's the one who comes to redeem and restore. He's the one who comes to make all things new. He's the one that even though we did not reach out to him, he reaches out to us so that we might have a new future. And here we see the beauty of the gospel that meets us to say, you are made new. You have a new identity. You are not your past. You are the future that God is bringing you to. Notice that Ruth could not have redeemed herself. She needed somebody to redeem her. And so for us, we do not redeem ourselves in Christianity. We come to the one who is the redeemer, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And by his life, death, and resurrection, he transcended any law that he gave. And he reached out to us when we were at our lowest moment. And he redeems and restores for himself a people. A people that once were no people is now made a people, made from every tribe, tongue, nation, political party, nationality, that we see that he is redeeming for himself a people. So if you think that you're unworthy of redemption, if you think the church labeled you as something because you are a man or because you are a woman, if you think that you are simply what your ancestors were or your history was or your last name is, God shows up today to say, that there is redemption in Jesus Christ because the love of God shows that his sovereignty is greater than your history. You thought your past disqualified you from being redeemed. You thought your family disqualified you. You thought the way society looks at you, the church looked at you. You thought there was no way of redemption. It is this beautiful story to say that even the Moabite is able to be redeemed. And so let your story know that whatever you feel like your guilt or your shame attached to you, that you feel like you're dragging that throughout your future and in your present, know that God is in the business of giving a new identity because his sovereignty overcomes your history. Jesus Christ, the righteous, is the one who transcends the law to make those who did not deserve grace to receive grace who did not receive, who did not deserve to receive redemption to experience redemption. And it is there where Jesus Christ the righteous is restoring and making all things new. It really is this reorientation of our entire narrative. That so often our narrative is shaped by what we think about ourselves, how much money's in our bank account, what we drive the experiences that we've had, the relationships we've been in, what our spouse or what our, our girlfriend or boyfriend said about us, what our parents said about us, that we begin to think that that's what we are trapped into. But the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ says that you are not your past. You are the future that God is bringing you into by the redemption found in Jesus Christ so that we have a new identity, so that we have a new future because God's sovereignty is greater than your history. And God is continuing to redeem and restore all things. And isn't that the beauty of the invitation to Jesus Christ? The beauty of the invitation to Jesus Christ is that so often in the Gospels, he shows up to those who are undeserving. He shows up to the prostitute. He shows up to the tax collector. He shows up to a bunch of guys who are blue-collar workers. He shows up to those who everybody would overlook, those who are unclean, those who are unhealed, those who don't seem like they have a future. That's who Jesus always shows up to, to redeem that future. And so it is that God continues to show up to those kind of people today. So if you feel like you are the one who got disqualified, that somehow, somewhere in your history, that you did things that you would say, God can't redeem that. That maybe your story is the very ticket that gives you right access to a God who redeems today. And what if there's a new identity given to you that is that you are a beloved daughter and son of God, that you have been purified, that you've been made new, that you have a new narrative, that when somebody asks you who you are, that you say, oh, let me tell you, I'm not who I was, I'm a daughter of the king. That when somebody asks what your identity flows from, that you say, I'm a son of the king. And there, there's a new kind of future in store for us. And so I wonder what it would look like for us to recognize that God has broken us from our past and is bringing us to our future.
And I wonder what it would look like for us to go out as a community of faith that calls other people to this, to recognize that they too can be redeemed. They too can be restored. They too don't have to be shackled to their history or to their family's history, but that God is continuing to break chains of addiction, to break chains of, chains of drug addiction and pornography, to break, break chains of poverty, to break chains of riches and finding our identity in those things that God has come to redeem and restore those who are least those who are last and those who are lost. And what if it is the call of the church to not go out and judge people based off of what their history is, but to be like those who are Boaz, to call them and to say that, they're, that maybe we can be a part of God bringing redemption, reconciliation to their story because God is still in the business of redeeming today. And so as we come to communion, as we come to the Lord's Supper, we come not alone, but we come together. Because so often what happens is throughout the week, we forget this identity. We forget this redemption. And so often we end up going back to our old identity, going back to our old history, going back to our old narratives. And as we come together as the body of Christ, we remind one another that our identity is found in Jesus Christ. That our identity is found what was done for us in the cross of Christ and the gift that is given to us is that we are a son or a daughter of God. And as we gather together and we partake in communion, it is a corporate reminder to say the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And here in the brokenness of God himself, you receive wholeness. Here in the brokenness of God, you receive healing. And so it is the purpose of the church to be those who come together to remind one another of the beauty of redemption found in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to have a time uh, where I'd love for us to break into groups. We're going to break into groups, and then actually we're going to participate in communion in those groups together as we minister to one another and we say to one another, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. I'm going to pray. We'll break into groups of like, six or seven, and then you'll select a representative, come down, receive the elements, and then we will receive the elements together in our groups as we remind one another of that good news of Jesus Christ, the redemption found in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that you would give us a new understanding that you are a God who does not simply come to those who have it all together but you are a God who comes to those who seem like everything is falling apart. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand that though our past might be something that we look back on and we feel like it identifies who we are today, that, Lord, as we come to you, that you are making us new and giving us a new future. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us to recognize, Lord, that there is a, a new reality that you are enacting by your grace and by your mercy. And that, Lord, we would recognize that in Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. I pray, Lord, that as we hear the word of the gospel in the word, in the, in the mouth of our brothers and sisters, that they say the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, that we would hear the new identity spoken over us that redeems us according to the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said,